Uh, we've got some questions online, but before we go to questions, I just quickly want to bring in Patrick Gregory, who's in the audience here, because we've talked a lot about Afghanistan, Egypt, um, Kenya. Patrick was actually a senior political producer at the BBC at Westminster, so dealing with British politics. And I thought just to do our impartial balance, because we like to do that in a media discussion. Patrick, maybe you can talk about the pressure that's put on British journalists at election time to tell the stories that politicians want to be heard. Yeah, I mean, in, in many respects, it's, um, it's almost like a, an interactive video game um, covering the uh, election, the usually four weeks of an election campaign and then the election day and aftermath uh, itself. Um, the, there are three ways, essentially, that uh, an agenda of the day or a coverage of the day would, would, would come around. One would be the agenda the, uh, the, the, which the parties would like to pump out themselves, be it on education, the economy, health, etc. The second um, would be um, as a result of an outside agency, for instance, there might be a set of uh, economic statistics that come out from the ONS or something like that and everyone reflects upon them or a, a report of some sort. Um, and the third is what happens. Um, it could be uh, you know, events of whatever uh, uh, unexpected nature. It could be um, a politician um, being more candid than he or she, she uh, would otherwise have liked to be. Um, it could be, as was the case in the last election when the Prime Minister Gordon Brown um, was mic'd up for some walk around event and was overheard being very disparaging about some lady in the crowd that he just met. Um, and so we will take a mishmash of all of these things, go up, get, uh, run with it in whatever form, in, in a changing way usually in the course of the day. It's never set in stone in one way. Um, uh, so it, it will evolve and the parties are often desperate to pull us back away from whatever is solidifying um, um, a, by the end of the day, late afternoon, early evening into the important news bulletins in the case of the BBC and the 6 and 10 o'clock news. They're very, very keen to try and get their, their hands on it. And so the pressure will come from um, uh, all sorts, subtle and not so subtle. Uh, in one respect, they will, they will push their, their people out onto the various media outlets to give their take on it. They will have rebuttal news conferences uh, in the course of, of the late afternoon. Um, but Ultimately, if things are not going their way, yes, through their uh, press officers, their, their uh, spin doctors, their um, uh, special advisors, um, they will be on the phone to you um, pointing out where exactly they think you've gone wrong and asking for this redress or other um, and sometimes uh, uh, overt um, or uh, implied threats that um, <laughs> they have your boss's telephone number and they will get on to them. Um, but it, it, it usually, um, I, I would say that elections themselves, I would say, I've, I've cov covered a, a good many of them, uh, go in cycles. Um, we've had different types of elections. We've got obviously changing um, uh, media techniques and uh, now with the advent of social media, it will continue evolving. Um, but uh, the uh, unique thing about the last election, not only in terms of its outcome of uh, giving us a coalition government, but having those prime ministerial debates, that changed the landscape uh, in a way which um, I hadn't seen in kind of four elections, five elections before that. It's unlikely to be repeated, I think, because the incumbent prime minister, it's up to uh, the, that person to say, yes, I will come down to your grubby level and talk to you. Uh, Gordon Brown, uh, I think, probably felt it was in his best interest to grant these debates because he had some ground to catch up. Um, but uh, it, 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 what happened there was an actual a real democratization of, um, of, of people's uh, ability to see and understand for themselves. And, and very often in electronic media these days, it's about it's about your impression of, of, of a candidate, of do I like this person, is he trustworthy? And um, they, through the prime ministerial debates, they were able to cut through a lot of the traditional media outlets, ourselves mm -hmm. included, 
if they hated us. We were trying to be fair, but maybe they hated us. Uh, and those things had a momentum of their own. And it'd be interesting to see in this next election next year what will replace that. Okay, thank you, Pat. So now a chance for you to ask some questions. Um, we've got a couple of questions online, but maybe I could just take a first um, two or three. Mark. Thanks. Well, I'd just like to start by thanking the speakers for a fascinating uh, set of presentations. I, I learned a lot. I actually want to pick up James on his last point where uh, he says there's little expertise within development agencies, so media concerns are rarely tracked. I mean, you know, we've talked about this uh, for a long time, and it's been something that you've mentioned many times. What, what exactly is the role that you think I mean, media, BBC Media Action is a development agency, but what, what, what is the role that you think development agencies are, could play? What, what aren't they doing that they could be doing? And why have you failed to persuade them that this is important? I mean, you know, you, your, your chief executive is from a uh, background, having worked at Oxfam and so on. So she must have had those sorts of conversations. Why, why have they got nowhere? Sorry, that's quite a <laughs> tough that's question. Right. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take a couple. And, um, and just if you could say who you're from as well. Mark, you're from the International yes. Broadcasting Sorry, Trust. Mark Galloway from IBT, International yeah. Broadcasting Trust. Okay, we just have another one here. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Uh, a couple of points. I wondered if Fatima could comment on something which uh, Daoud said about using the foreign media in a sense, to ask the embarrassing questions and to publish the embarrassing stories, because uh, you were rather disparaging of what the foreign <coughs> media could do. Is there a role for this? And a question to, to both of you on the, the financing point, because I think this is tremendously important, because I've, I've worked more on uh, Latin American media, but the loss of their traditional advertising media has been a real problem. <laughs> and presumably, I, I wonder how your local uh, newspapers actually are supported and the same question for the Afghan. And just, uh, I was seriously worried by, by James's emphasis, which is actually nicely illustrated on his final slide, on so-called ordinary people. I mean, journalism is a profession. Knowing how to ask questions, knowing how to investigate stories is a learned skill. And trying to encourage politicians not to talk to journalists, but instead to talk to a businesswoman in uh, Kenya, or indeed, uh, a, uh, a pensioner, I believe it was, to Gordon Brown, is actually the, the wrong approach, surely. It, it's letting the politicians off easily. So why did you put so much emphasis on this? Okay, so uh, James, a couple there to you. So maybe you want to pick up first and then Fatima a little bit about the role of the foreign media. And maybe that's something you can jump in on as well, Michaela, because in a way you were the foreign media in some of these places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Me um, so, so to Mark's question on what is the role of a development, ag the development agency, and I guess, and I mean here, mostly donor agency, and why have we not been more successful in en encouraging them to, to take an interest in media? So the first thing I think is, um, in my view, there is a growing crisis, which actually wasn't the case 10, 15, or maybe even five years ago, of um, money for public interest content. Um, I think there was uh, an awful lot of media five, 10, 15 years ago was actually commercially funded and was doing a really quite a good job of reflecting the perspectives <coughs> of ordinary people, um, providing information on the issues that shape their lives and creating outlets for, um, for their voice. Um, I think there's a diminishing evidence that that's, that function is being served. I mean, that's obviously massively different <coughs> in different countries. And in that sense, I think there's a growing problem of public subsidy. Uh, it, it, if it matters that people have information on the issues that shape their lives in a form that they can trust, and if it matters that they have access to platforms for public debate that enable them to engage in a reasonably equal process, um, then it's very unclear where the money to pay for that is coming from. And so in my view, yes, there is a growing role for 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 people with, act with money, in this case donors, but it can be anyone, who is interested in the public interest, 
because I think the price of not having those, those things in, in countries, and I think we're seeing that in Arab Spring countries, but elsewhere too, um, I think is growing. I wouldn't go so far as to say, I'm being accused of being slightly zealous about this by some of my colleagues, but I would go so far, far as to say that in, in many fragile states, a precondition for um, uh, an effective state, an effective society, is actually having some kind of system where people can uh, gain issues on the, on, 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 you know, I, I, I have access to information on the issues that shape their lives. So I think there's a problem of public subsidy, first of all. Why are we having different, I think we're, we're getting better, I think we are succeeding actually more than we were in, um, in, in, in getting development agencies, donor agencies to understand this. I think they are taking this a lot more seriously than they were. But they are facing their own staff cuts and, and actually getting them to start actually having people focused on this issue is a very, very difficult thing to to, to, to achieve. Um, I better show the ba one very quick yep. thing on, on the audiences. So I think I just disagree, actually. I mean, I, I think, I mean, we have, a, we put a huge amount of, of investment into research. Um, we have about 80 researchers in the organization. And their, their job is really to find out what people want um, in terms and need, what, they, what the information communication needs, aspirations, realities of people, particularly living, people living in poverty are. And people aren't just economically marginalized, they're often economically and politically marginalized because they don't have access to information. And a lot of our research around this is, you know, we have, we're, one of the fundamental things we're trying to achieve is political efficacy. We didn't know that people like us could ask questions like this of our political leaders. And that's a fundamental thing we are trying to achieve. Is actually, which is, which is, which is not just a journalistic issue. It is finally, it is fundamentally the analysis we've done, big research we've done in Bangladesh, for example, is what people felt is they had a massive gap between themselves and politicians. They could not ask questions of them. And what we do is enable them to ask questions of their politicians directly, in front of an audience of millions. And we think that does have quite a strong sanction on politicians to take those questions seriously. The question okay. about foreign media, media and the role of foreign media. I don't mean to be disparaging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, but and, and there are some places, and it should be a great role that foreign media could play. And I remember many years ago, I think it was 20 years ago, CNN did a story. This one? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. CNN did a story on female circumcision in Egypt. And it opened the floodgates, you know, it broke the taboo, and all of a sudden it was all over the place, and it was in reaction to that story, we couldn't ignore it anymore in the public space. And that was a very good thing. Uh, having said that, though, and since 9-11 in particular, what we've seen is that there is really, there is an agenda. The story is known, and it's just c reporters are coming in to prove the story. And I remember after 9-11, I was working with a foreign journalist, a uh, big U.S. paper, uh, on he was doing the Why They Hate Us story, which was uh, has been the big story since then. And uh, when he was out on the street, people were coming up and giving him their condolences. And this was driving him nuts because he couldn't do the other story. He had to do the why they hate us story. And, it, you know, there was a disconnect here. Uh, and, and, and there are a lot of, uh, um, it's not anecdotal. There's a lot of that. And so when you have a foreign media, which is increasingly perceived and understood to actually have an agenda that they're fulfilling, it no longer works to break, you know, the taboo. What it does is it reinforces all of those negative uh, impressions. Um, the financing point, of course, very, very um, critical one. Uh, let me uh, step back from that just a second. In Egypt, we have an extremely distorted market, highly mm. centralized. Uh, um, national media has the government funding, and then there are some big businessmen who own some uh, private media, and you know they finance it through their money. The advertising market has been in crisis. Even uh, satellite television stations now are not making money off of advertising. Everyone is making money off of the big businessmen under the table, and we have Abu Zabi and Dubai and all of those other people putting up money for political reasons to support media, which is giving out a very clear message that supports their interests. And then you have an organization like ours, which is uh, funded so far uh, and is working to create for itself uh, a business model within this distorted market that actually functions so that we can become more sustainable and we're working on developing local advertising markets, et cetera. The context is very challenging. Okay, that, the word international media. Yeah, I mean, uh, International media has been accused of many things, especially over the past two years. Uh, for example, uh, they've been accused of uh, focusing too much on death and destruction. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, spreading fear about the collapse of the state or collapse of government after 2014 of the withdrawal of foreign forces and uh, again having an agenda. So uh, even President Karza in a couple of press conferences named some of the international media outlets of having an agenda or working against his government or trying to put <laughs> pressure on his government. Uh, uh, they usually quote unnamed or unknown officials and uh, then they just publish the story or ran the story uh, if it is a radio or television. So it has been accused of m many of these things. But it's also a fact that uh, people trust the international media more than the local media because they think that local media is biased, is not balanced, and uh, uh, is not impartial enough. Uh, especially the BBC is trusted more um, uh, when it comes to international broadcasters. And uh, uh, when it comes to funding, uh, funding uh, is mainly by donors, uh, especially over the past 10 or 12 years. Most of the media is funded by the US, USAID, and DFID, um, and other international agencies. And uh, some of it uh, is funded by re neighboring or regional countries because uh, a few neighboring states were accused of uh, supporting some media outlets financially because they have their own agendas. They want to have influence uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, war former warlords or politicians, I mean, they have recognized the importance of media. Uh, they want to have their own television station or radio, or they want to have people in uh, a particular radio or television station because um, that way they can get more coverage. Uh, in the past, I mean, people had militias. Then they s started opening businesses. Uh, they thought that, okay, having a militia is not enough, so let's start to, uh, to have a business. And then they thought that, oh, you also need uh, a TV or radio station. So now they have uh, their fingers <laughs> in, in, in many places. So this is another source of funding. So donors, uh, neighboring countries, uh, private businessmen, or uh, former warlords or politicians. And uh, when it comes <laughs> to trust, I mean, uh, there, as they say, there are three uh, Cs, uh, credibility, clarity, and consistency. Um, some of the international media outlets uh, have been accused of not following the, uh, the, the rule of three C's. Uh, so s there is no consistency or lack of consistency and uh, uh, credibility is damaged uh, w when it comes to false reporting. And it's the same with a number of local media outlets. Um, they're not consistent enough or they are not uh, seen as credible because they uh, run a story uh, one day, the next day they run something mm, which is totally the opposite of what they reported on yesterday. So th there is a lack of consistency as well. And that's where the training comes, the training element comes uh, that James mentioned. Mm. Uh, so it's still a work in progress. So with the passage of time, I guess things will get better. Michaela, just a quick word from you as a um, of that. Yeah, no, I mean, there was a huge amount of hostility towards the Western press um, during the last elections in Kenya, including myself. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I'm very proud of this headline in the 1,000... There's something called Jackal News, which seems to have faded since its founder disappeared, which um, is a bit of a relief. Uh, he, he ran a 1,200-page diatribe. British journalist Michaela Wrong has done to Kenya what a dire rare child does to a nappy. <laughs> and um, uh, and I mean uh, I wanted to say earlier headline, it's great headline <laughs> and I wish she'd included um, pictures but anyway um, no I mean uh, it was there was extraordinary amount of vitriolic uh, coverage it wasn't helped by the fact that CNN ran a very um, irresponsible piece about a pre-election arming that most people regarded as laughable mm. but this was seized upon and I can't help but feel that the Western media became the butt of coverage because there was this silence by the Kenyan media. The Kenyan media were not putting up any challenges. They had, fo they had folded. Um, and so I think the, um, 
the people who, <laughs> who ended up winning the elections were looking around for possible areas of contestation, challenge, disrespect, uh, and the areas where Western media, uh, foreign ambassadors who got it in the back of the neck as well, lots of really, really vicious campaigns waged against them, um, which they were very quiet about, but were extraordinarily, um, you know, accusations that the British were invading Kenya with a force of, of uh, a naval force at Mombasa during the election, run up to the election. Um, and not, uh, the Brits did not make a big fuss about that uh, at the time. Um, but also civil society. Kenyan civil society was the other target. Uh, and what we saw was this campaign against evil society. Uh, they're all spies. They're paid for by, by foreign donors. The fact that the same foreign donors also give money to the Kenyan government was never mentioned. So I think, yeah, there was a... a, a if you have a supine um, uh, domestic press, the attention shifted. And, and in Kenya, you got... Um, extraordinarily unpleasant bullying, intimidation, um, most of it anonymous, um, very well orchestrated, very well organized, uh, lots of um, blogging, fake names, um, and you could sometimes tell when you read anything that was glowing about Uhuru, it would then have four or five supposed comments from supposed readers that all said the same thing, and it was quite clear this was being organized, you know, this was not a spontaneous audience reaction at all. And the opposition was really incompetent in that they should and could have done, uh, uh, mounted a similar campaign but did not really do anything quite so effective. Okay, I've got uh, some questions online. Interestingly, two on social media uh, from slightly different directions. One um, saying, from Miguel, saying in countries like Colombia where freedom of speech and freedom of press doesn't exist. How is it possible to deliver just an independent coverage? Does alternative media and social media have a key for this? Maybe that's something that Fatima and, and da Dawood, you could pick up. Uh, and actually, f another observation from Patrick in Kenya. What's the role of social media in ameliorating the failure of the mainstream media uh, in situations such as the, the Kenyan election? So maybe that's, that's a question just, just for you. So some quick reflections on actually something we haven't touched on very much, which is what is the role of social media now in this really uh, rapidly changing um, uh, landscape? Well, I mean, the Egyptian revolution is uh, the revolution everyone says was born of, you know, social media, Facebook and Twitter, and mm. the role they play is, is known. Um, and uh, for the first year after the revolution, we could see social media actually leading the story, pressuring mainstream media. Uh, and this was, again, another key role. The problem was uh, that this never actually made inroads into mainstream media. And because it didn't, what we find is three years down the line, that alternative media is being sidelined, and again, the story is being set by mainstream media, and there's a consolidation of that power. So I think it's as effective as it's actually incorporated into that public space, and it actually does make inroads into mainstream and traditional media as well. So yeah, social media is new in Afghanistan because most of the people still don't have electricity, mm -hmm. and uh, most of them don't have access to the internet. Uh, but uh, between 5 to 10 percent of people have access to the internet and uh, um, some of them uh, use uh, social media. It's mainly Facebook. Uh, Facebook is more popular than Twitter and some people have uh, their blogs, some journalists and writers. Uh, but the problem is uh, illiteracy uh, because uh, literacy is around 30 percent in Afghanistan, and uh, out of those thirty, many of them don't have access to internet and electricity. So the impact is not that big. So it's slowly growing, but uh, it is uh, those who are on uh, who are using social media are very active. Uh, they um, discuss many issues. Some of those issues can be labeled as very sensitive. Um, so. It is new, it is growing, uh, but the impact is not that great mm -hmm. when uh, it is compared with the traditional media. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Michaela, any observations about social media? I, I think the problem with social media is that so much of it is anonymous, and I would like to see people shaming... I mean, I would like to see a change in the rules of engagement 
by 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 the companies that that, that own these outlets. But I, th I think people should just shame each other into not being anonymous because it is. Uh, I I've had very negative experience um, uh, of social media's use. Um, not just uh, regarding Kenya. Uh, recently, I was organizing uh, a part of a, um, um, an NGO that organized a series of talks on Eritrea. And every single time, there were four talks, every single time the talk was about to come, there was just this you know, barrage of abusive um, tweets. And it was clearly aimed you know, from people who are supporting the government, didn't like the fact that some of the content was going to be critical of the government. And it was clearly aimed at frightening people off, don't go to the talk, don't listen. Uh, and it's all anonymous, usually. Um, and I think, you know, what, what we just have to get into a situation where if it's anonymous, people will ignore it, not retweet it, not pass it on, and certainly not regard it as having any credibility. So, I mean, my experience of social media in Africa mm -hmm. has been extremely negative. I think it's been a very different experience in Egypt and, I, I, you know, in other parts of Africa. James? Uh, ju just very quickly, I... I, I Clearly, social media is massively liberating. It is a check on mainstream traditional media power, can be, um, it creates independent spaces. I think, I think separating it out from traditional media over time isn't always helpful. And I think one of the things that you can increasingly argue in quite a lot of countries, certainly not all of them, and not just in developing countries, is that the reason media exists, social and traditional, the reason it's there is to advance a particular perspective. Um, uh, it's there to advance an agenda. And I think increasingly, a lot of traditional media is there because it's there, it's funded, paid for, to advance a particular set of interests. And you can say exactly the same with an awful lot of social media, too. And that's quite frightening. Mm. Um, but that's a, that is a kind of big But the agendas away. are hidden because the people yes, are anonymous. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's so sinister. Yeah. So the idea yeah. of it being there to inform people, to put, uh, we have on our cards, audiences are at the heart of everything we do. That ain't necessarily the case. Time for, uh, yeah, two here. OK, we'll take these three. Yeah. Thank you very much. My question is to James Dean. Can you, you say who you are? Uh, my name is Khalid al-Mubarak. I am the media counselor at the Embassy of the Sudan in London. Mm -hmm. You have quoted Paul Collier. We know what Paul Collier thinks of elections and uh, democracy in countries with a high degree of illiteracy and uh, general backwardness and no uh, strong institutions. Do you think we are condemned to live with some imperfections in democracies in our part of the world until institutions are built and until there is a more better informed electorate to satisfy Paul Korea and others. Thank you. Alexandra <laughs> Vicenti, <laughs> 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 I work on the Middle East projects for BBC Media Action and I was an international observer in the election in the referendum in Sudan. <laughs> Um, but um, actually, my, my qu it's more a comment. It's actually really interesting what Fatima said, because I'm also Egyptian, but um, the, about the, um, the fact that, you know, the, the problems that local journalists are facing, because this is something that's very, it's not talked about a lot. It's not getting the same attention as when violence or uh, arrests are made against foreign media. Um, so I, I had a question about um, how you operate, actually, and in terms of, you know, we're now talking about social media, and actually, no, it's not different. It's, it's very sinister as well in Egypt right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's more a question about um, what sorts of platforms are you using, because in Egypt, we don't read. Um, and you're, I noticed that you're using video, you're using social media, but um, there's a real problem with Egyptian media because it's very centralized, and it's also partly due to the fact that the state broadcaster is failing to represent, but also failing in general. So um, what's, you know, how do you operate as a, as a local media, as a media focused around community, and what sorts of platform do you think are the most efficient to actually mm -hmm. reach people? Okay, great, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Martin Barber, and I used to work for the United Nations. Um, I also want to raise the question of Paul Collier. But in <laughs> He's not here. But, <laughs> in, but, but in a slightly different uh, context, because one of the things that he points out is that 
Western governments are encouraging uh, countries in Africa and Asia to adopt political systems and electoral systems that they would never adopt in their own countries, which are, in his view, far too centralized and are of the winner-takes-all variety. Um, to what extent do you think media in these countries can help to educate the population and even indeed its, its leaders about the risks of a winner-takes-all electoral system? I don't get the impression that Paul Collier is against uh, democracy, uh, but rather against particular types of democracy which actually disenfranchise almost half the voters. Okay, so um, Paul Collier question. I'll go last. <laughs> okay, well let's take the let's pick up the first one on the specific one on the platforms that you're using, okay. Fatima, yeah. um, and then maybe we'll pick up the um, are we using uh, the you know are we encouraging a certain type of political system uh, through through the use of of, of media. <coughs> okay, uh, I just want to, if you will allow me, uh, say something about sinister social media. <laughs> okay, because because in all fairness also, you know, and we, we see this everywhere, um, people who are using social media to, uh, to inform and to uncover that which mainstream media will not also put themselves at risk. There's a serious security problem here. And and um, the anonymity issue, of course, is a problem, but it is that's the other side of that coin. It should also be acknowledged. Uh, about platforms, we use uh, we use all the platforms. We have uh, newspapers because in a big part of Egypt, outside of the big cities, people want to have the paper. This tells them that this is actually a legitimate news source. If it's not on television, then it has to be in paper. So we find that the reading um, sales in Egypt of newspapers is very low for such a big country, but the readers reader ratio is one to five. This is the accepted number. So, you know, around five to ten people probably will be reading any newspaper that is bought. So we have the print, the video, social media, and online platforms are for younger generation users. Uh, and uh, we use the mix because, you know, Egyptians, a lot of them are on Facebook, and so they use Facebook. And referrals to online news mainly comes from Facebook as well, so this is another reason why. We also run an SMS service because everyone has mobile phone, so we use the news alert now. This is an additional service. So it's multi-platform uh, to try and engage all those different, uh, and also to try and increase our revenue generating mm -hmm. uh, base, so for both reasons. Um, uh, do the, does the media encourage the winner takes all situation? <laughs> really? <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> it has been doing so. Um, uh, in the case of Egypt right now, I don't think that, you know, the winner is going to take much that is very good. I mean, it's, it's very, it's really quite uh, a country to take over at this time. So we have, we're looking at presidential elections where it's really going to be a uh, landslide for, uh, uh, for CC. This is what we all expect. Uh, if would we consider him a winner? <laughs> <laughs> in the biggest sense, it's, it's you know what does he have to offer to solve all the problems that are on the table now? Uh, so it's you know it's um, um, I think this is the mindset. I don't know uh, how 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 useful it is in, in in thinking what's going to happen down the line because I don't think what we're going to see in Egypt is another situation where we have this leader sitting at the top of the state and. Um, for another 30 years. Uh, you know, what we're going to have is there's going to be a lot of contention, there's going to be a lot of fight back, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, resistance uh, once nothing starts being delivered. This is what we saw with Morsi, and it's probably what we'll see with any other presidential candidate that wins, uh, landslide or no. So we've what, what about you? Do you feel like um, there is this, this perfect system that's being promoted, the winner takes all system? Do you see that? that's percolating in the, the um, Afghanistan elections. And the system, the post-Taliban Afghanistan governance system is mostly based on the US model, it's the presidential system. But a lot of people uh, have been talking about changes. Uh, they want, some of them want a parliamentary system, so some of them have mentioned a federal system. Uh, so we will see after the elections, so we might see some changes in the system. But president has got a lot of power, as uh, you know, in the case of U.S. Uh, in Afghanistan, the president can appoint cabinet ministers, but they have to seek the parliament's approval. 
can appoint provincial governors and um, heads of many other uh, directorates and commissions. So in a way, it is like the winner takes all uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, but it's mostly a coalition government in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. so it's not only the president who is running the show. All the other factions are also part of the government. Uh, but when it comes to media in uh, conflict situations like Sudan, so it's more challenging for the media uh, to cover events in a post-conflict situation because in many countries, uh, the journalists, or they cannot manage the line between debate and conflict. So sometimes they think that they're resolving the conflict, so it's the opposite. So managing the line between debate and conflict is also important, uh, both in traditional media and new mm -hmm. media. Because in uh, new media, we have seen that some uh, people are anonymous, they just start a debate and it might be based on r rumor, but mm -hmm. it perpetuates the conflict and doesn't help the resolution of mm -hmm. the conflict. Just time for a couple of maybe two last ones here. So Alina and, yep, do you want to go first, Alina? Um, Alina Rochameno Caro ODI. Just picking up on this last point, uh, one thing that I have heard said very often is that in post-conflict settings, elections are a way of waging conflict by another name. Uh, could you uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about what you think <laughs> of this in the different settings that you um, are involved in and uh, what kind of role does media play? Is it a shield or a weapon? Uh, Peter Tesh. Um Media and Public Relations Council of uh, Mauritanian Embassy in London. Um, I don't know whether I'm gamekeeper or poacher. I have covered uh, elections and situations in Sahel, Sudan, uh, Mauritania, and Indonesia. I'm now uh, I've worked for the Indonesian Embassy. I've worked in for the I'm now with the Mauritanian Embassy. Um, my I want to go back to indeed the foreign media because. I have seen foreign media on, on both sides. I, I have seen colleagues of mine who, who come with preconceived ideas, whether on the left or the right, and they go into a country and they dismiss what, they, what doesn't confirm and only look for what confirms their, their whatever you know, that, that, that is. Uh, last December, we had municipal and parliamentary elections in Mauritania. Um, the few stories which were firstly off the radar in, 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 in the Western media. The first, one of the few stories that made it was a boycott call by a traditional party of Ahmed Wudbara, who was not going to make it anyway, but he didn't want to delete the, delegitimize the election beforehand by calling it a boycott. The turnout was higher than in France or in the UK or in some other European countries. There were uh, thousands of candidates, tens of, of different parties. It was fought over two elections, so it was complete kind of, you know, this, this, this in that sense, a winner-take-all mm -hmm. situation. Then after that, the, the folks turned a bit on a breakthrough of the Brotherhood Party. The Tabazul, yes, they won a few seats, but hardly a breakthrough. W an underlying story which we didn't really make the kind of hit the Western media was that some of the uh, traditional opposition party of Haratin, of, of Black Moors, in fact, they, they lost. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and Black Moors voted for tradition, went for other parties. That was lost, in fact. Okay, okay. So, and there's also one question online, which we can take uh, in the last round. Where media houses are more political actors than neutral observers, how can external agencies support media without losing neutrality themselves? Maybe that, that's one that you can pick up, Jane. But maybe we can have an answer to this question of uh, elections waging war by other means and what, you know, it had, what role does media play in that battle? Well, m media, media's role is very important, but it comes back to the institutions. If the institutions are strong and if there are enough laws and they are implemented properly, then uh, media cannot be used as a weapon. It can be used as a platform. It can be used as an educator or a forum. But as we have seen in many post-conflict situations, it is 
at least in the first few years, it, it has been used as a, as a weapon uh, or as a stick. So as long as the institutions are weak enough, then the media will, or at least some of the privately owned media will take advantage of that, uh, that situation, fragile situation. But uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, there is a media law at the moment. Uh, Afghanistan doesn't have an access to information law. Journalists have been asking for this. Uh, and there are some media watchdogs, uh, some media monitoring commissions. Uh, so as long as the state has these institutions and in a proper legal framework, then they can monitor media, they can control media. Otherwise, I mean, it's just another tool uh, that a party or a group has to mm -hmm. use against another group or party. Mm -hmm. That's one. We've seen a lot of this, uh, obviously in Egypt, uh, just last week there was a talk show host on primetime saying that if he saw someone that he thought might be an Ikhwan member, that he would not give him to the police, he would kill him. <laughs> and, you know, during on primetime TV. So, I mean, there's this, there's this, this waging of war, there's this settling of accounts. We've seen a lot of settling of accounts. I think that the uh, verdict the uh, for the... Uh, death sentencing, uh, the 530 something uh, death sentences that were given out in two days. This is another way where you have another institution here, not the media, the judiciary, uh, settling accounts uh, again with the Muslim Brotherhood. So I mean, this is uh, a reality that we see playing out. The, the media should play a role as a platform, uh, you know, to um, explain what is happening, uh, uncover uh, the realities behind these decisions, etc. It doesn't. Uh, because it is, also, it is also highly polarized. And the problem here with looking at legislation as an answer is that legislation will come out of what we're seeing now. And that means that the legislation itself will be inadequate, to say the least. So again, there, there, there are no easy answers here. I think it's how to develop best practice uh, in small bits and pieces and piece that together into a more responsible uh, media practice. Uh, that would then be the grounds to actually develop legislation and ethical codes uh, on the national level that could be coming. James? So just two quick questions. So, so first of all, how do we support media without taking sides or getting sort of um, compromised? It's very difficult. Um, I mean, one answer to that is we insist we don't get compromised. And so our partnership with RTA, I think, with, in, with in Afghanistan is a good example state broadcaster but where the, the partnership is fundamentally based on 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 adhering to bbc values but it is difficult we, we support mrtv in burma for example and on um, um it's not a it's not a bbc program but we are supporting them we're tra training them and they're just producing their first current affairs program as a result for example it's never happened before in the country but is that sort of is that to bbc values no it's not so so it, it's always a delicate line we're trying to to tread, but it's one which is worth worth treading. I, di I didn't answer the question from S Sudan on the kind of. And I just want. I think this is an important thing mm -hmm. to say. I, I, th I think the, the kind of sort of the, the whole n debate over the last 20, 30 years about what the best approach to state building is and democratic development and so on. And and one of the reasons, coming back to Mark's question about why media doesn't tend to get the prominence, I'd argue it deserves, is that there is a real nervousness on the part of development actors and donors. Uh, to support media in a context when we should be actually bu building up uh, the institutions of a state, we should be building up uh, in very fragile states who don't want to build up an opposition, you don't want to build up anything that will undermine the fragility of very weak, often sometimes quite weak governments. I think that we have to acknowledge that in the last five years, reality has changed and that we are living in a ubiquitously connected planet where even some of the poorest countries have got increasingly ubiquitous access to mobile telephony and to satellite inf inf media and so on. The idea that the policy option available to governments to, to censor control the media is still available, but it's very expensive. It's very brutal. It's very difficult. I think we're seeing it in, 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 um, in, in Egypt at the moment. It's, a, it's, it's not a good policy option. It's freedom of the media is something that I passionately believe in, but it is also a reality. And this is something that, therefore, you start, there, there needs to be a different discourse around this in the context of state building. You don't have the option of building up these institutions and in some hermetically sealed world where you're not going to be, you don't have this big public conversation going on around it. We are living in a noisy, different, connected world. And that's what 
reality is. Now, the final thing I'd say on that, and I would say this because I work for BBC Media Action, <laughs> and it's the last point on my, on my slides, uh -huh. is the role of public service broadcasting in this environment. It's not something I actually used to think was so important, and I'm not talking about mm. rolling out BBCs around the world, but some system that provides people with access to independent information and provides a platform for a debate where they can dis discuss and argue, where people who fundamentally disagree with each other can debate and argue with each other, is absolutely critical in a context of particularly of fragile and fractured states. And so I do think that this debate needs to move on. It's a different, it's, we're not mm. talking about the same issues as we were talking about three or four or five years ago. It's very, very, very difficult to achieve a successful transition from a state broadcaster to an independent public service broadcaster. Arguably more difficult than ever before. The, 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 the political price to be paid for that is high. The, the, the need for that to happen in terms of the su success of a society in a state is really, really important. We need to find fresh, creative ways of thinking about that. Michaela, maybe a final thought from you. Uh, the, the point of the gentleman was kind of how do you pick the stories, which is the oh. age-old yeah. old well, question. Well, um, yes, I just wanted to say one thing about First Past the Post. In Kenya, they introduced a new constitution which is aimed specifically at, at ending that system of centralization. But it's very interesting because um, the, the, it seems to me that the presidency wants to centralise again. So there's an ongoing, fascinating tussle, and it's going to be well worth watching. And it's an African state trying to reverse that centralisation tendency of, of decades and decades. But I mean, um, as far as the gentleman was concerned, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with that problem of Western journalists who go in and either don't, can't understand in a very short space of time or, or don't want to because they have already decided what the story is. Um, and um, you know the, the the advantage of having the outside parachuted journalist is that he can't be threatened, um, lose his job, uh, suborned. So you know there there's a balance here, which is if you're an outsider, you, you may misunderstand, but you're also less like you're you're not in in the, you're not facing the risks of a local journalist. And in certain situations, that's going to be absolutely crucial and will allow a certain kind of coverage that wouldn't have got through otherwise. Um, but uh, you know, what you ideally want is to have someone who has all that understanding and insight, uh, but is also completely independent. But often that simply isn't possible in a certain situation. So that brings our discussion today to a close. I just want to say thank you very much to the panel um, for their brilliant analysis, their solutions, but also that first hand experience of, of reporting from those places and trying to do the job of you know independent impartial journalism in really really tough situation so Michaela Dawood James and Fatima thank you very much indeed uh, for coming to ODI to talk about these issues and if you enjoyed it a lot you'll see it online uh, over the next couple of days so you can log in again and there's some tea and treats and refreshments afterwards for those who are interested.